I'm going to be talking to Dr. Christian Leiprecht, who is a professor in the Department of Political Science at Queen's University and the Royal Military College, about the Freedom Convoy uh, that's uh, currently occupying uh, Ottawa uh, and the blockades at Coots, Alberta and Windsor, Ontario border crossings. Is this a form of modern warfare waged by malicious actors outside of Canada to undermine the Canadian governments and the economy? So welcome to the interview, Christian. Hello. Okay, let's dive right into this. Uh, what's your take on whether or not we're, we're at, basically Canada is at war? Well, there's different metrics we can take here. So Peter Slowly, the chief of police in Ottawa, a veteran, of course, of the G7, G20 uh, protests in Toronto, uh, has referred to this as both an occupation and he has referred to it as an insurrection. And so both of these inherently suggest that this is more than just a political protest, that this has gone well beyond those boundaries. So that's just to kind of say that there's, I think, good context for the question that you're asking. Inherently implicit in the question that you're asking is whether there are outside forces on the one hand and perhaps bad actors on the other hand. So I want to distinguish between those two. Um, either, both of those constitute foreign interference in our democratic process and institutions and values. And so we can get back to this problem of foreign interference. But by the outside actors here, there are two actors that have motivations, one of which we already are aware of. So we know that some um, US politicians um, and some US uh, broadcasters have already weighed in um, in favor of the protests or at least some of the um, demands that are being made by the protesters, although not necessarily perhaps um, condoning the tactics that are being used. And so that suggests that there's certainly um, a sympathy, probably a considerable sympathy um, among a minority of the US population that is aware of these protests for what is transpiring in Ottawa. And so that would suggest that there are individuals who might also be uh, f predisposed to assisting the folks in Ottawa. And the obvious way that they can assist is by donating money. And so this is sort of where we got suspicious when people raised $10 million in a matter of days for this convoy. Um, there are many organizations with professional fundraising arms in this country uh, that raise less money than that in a given year. Um, and when we have appeals, Red Cross appeals for whatever earthquake in Haiti or whatever disaster might strike, these are not usually the numbers that we raise. So right there, we have sort of, I think, some... Uh, some reason to be so sort of suspicious that there perhaps might be US money uh, or other money involved. The Americans tend to have a lot more resources. So, uh, and we know that there's um, a number of different foundations as well as individuals who might be predisposed to this type of support. The other is that we of course currently have a dispute um, with a major power in Europe over geopolitics and the future of, uh, of Europe, as well as the appropriate ways to uh, go about uh, deciding those futures. And so there are also bad actors um, beyond North America that would have um, an incentive to try to perhaps um, indirectly support the protesters and funding money uh, would be an obvious way to do this. So the Putin regime has about a trillion dollars parked outside of uh, 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 Russia in the West, um, about 800 billion of those are available to the regime and about 200 billion of those uh, Vladimir Putin thought to control directly and is known to have instrumentalized for Russian purposes um, in the past. So if you put Russia's financial capabilities as well as their dis misinformation and, and information laundering capabilities together, you would again have another, would, would have a bad actor. Um, I want to dif distinguish between the two because clearly if you have involvement by um, authoritarian regimes with political motives um, and state sponsored, then that's what I refer to as a bad actor. If we have involvement by forces from the United States with which we might perhaps disagree, but that are not necessarily state sponsored per se, then those might be nefarious actors, but they're not necessarily bad actors in the sense that it is not the US government that is actively trying to undermine our institutions, but rather civil society interests. 
uh, Christian, the reason I asked you, are we at war, is because we now know that cyber warfare, for example, is a, uh, a growing form of conflict between nation states. We think of the uh, U.S. efforts to undermine the Iranian uh, nuclear program using cyber warfare, getting into their, their uh, com uh, computers that control the, these programs. And it seems like the... Uh, efforts to use social media and foreign, you know, and use funding uh, to support uh, uh, groups within a country, like uh, they could be white supremacists, they could be Nazi groups, they could be other kinds of bad actors within a country. That, that just seems to be a natural extension of, the, of cyber warfare. And it, is that a, a fair analysis or am I off base here? Yeah, so this is often what's called as referred to as gray zone tactics, because they fall below a declaration of war. And so they fall below Article 5. And as a result, um, their international law doesn't apply. So the law of armed conflict, the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And this is precisely why bad actors such as Russia um, or the Chinese regime, for instance, stay below that threshold, because really, in many ways, it's anarchic. There are no rules for um, how to engage in that space. And in that space, they have really been for 15 years, Russia since 2007, for instance, been pressing Western countries hard um, on a spectrum, on a political, politically, economically, diplomatically, in cyber affairs, uh, culturally and socially. And so I think the one misconception that I can correct here is it's often thought that Russia, for instance, has an interest in manipulating our elections one way or another, or they have an interest in deliberately supporting certain bad actors that you name, for instance, on the extreme right or so. But really, their objective is much more simple. They want to divide and polarize our societies, and they want to delegitimize our democratic institutions. They want to divide and polarize so that they can show that democratic institutions don't work. And if they can delegitimize our democratic institutions, then they can sell it to their own audiences back home in China and in Russia as who would want to live in this type of regime. Look how much better you have it when you have a kleptocratic elite um, in Moscow uh, that's uh, a self-interested kleptocratic elite um, that's uh, running your country. So the purpose is really much more simple. And so they'll really engage in any opportunity that they can see to try to distort information, route information, or with modest amounts of money, support groups, for instance, uh, that advance that particular purpose of polarization and delegitimization. And I suppose then that the, uh, say, Russia's uh, objectives would be, uh, geopolitical objectives would be served by uh, destabilizing uh, Canada a little bit, uh, given that it's a member of NATO and, and there's a conflict over Ukraine at the moment. And uh, is that uh, part of their objective is, is when they're being, you know, there's direct geopolitical conflict, that if wherever they can foment some unrest and, and distract national governments, that works to their advantage? Yes, but of course, Canada is a strategic hinge sort of within the alliance, especially the transatlantic, the Euro-Atlantic security community. It is the only other country in North America. As a result, it has a very special relationship with the United States. Um, and so if you can destabilize Canada um, and make it less credible, then it also means that there is uh, there's sort of one, one less stable element in North America that can contribute to this transatlantic security relationship that is really provided for um, the most stable, prosperous, um, harmonious society that the world really has ever known. If you look at sort of what we've built in North America since the end of World War II, through the strategic collaboration between Canada and the United States that has long been premised since the Kingston Declaration and, 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 uh, and, and the Kingston uh, Dispensation, the Ogdensburg Declaration in 1940, that Canada and the US would work together to keep bad actors and bad elements away from North America. So clearly you can achieve that objective. The other is, of course, that Canada is a key partner in NATO. It brings commitments, capabilities, um, and cash to the table. Um, and so Canada is always a valued partner, especially by the United States around the table, and is one of the major uh, countries. It's one of the half dozen countries that brings headquarter capabilities and sort of brings real capacities to the table. So if you can sow doubt in Canada, you can destabilize, you can delegitimize Canada, um, and I would say, you know, the 
the the unbelievable proposition that somehow we need to call in the military to quell with this is of course an intentional and deliberate attempt to undermine our democracy because there's absolutely no reason to call in the military we have ample police but if you can call in the military then we look like an authoritarian state exactly the ones that that the actions that we like to criticize, it would serve Russia and China's purpose for us to do that because then it's hard for us to turn around when they do likewise in their own countries. Um, so I think all that sort of to say is that uh, given how Canada's connectivity and it's important, both in terms of relationship with the United States and its relationship with Europe, um, it's absolutely in the geostrategic interest for uh, outside actors to de de destabilize and delegitimize uh, our country, um, our prosperity, our security and our democracy. Christian, how can Canadians know that this is going on, or know that they're that uh, that we're being that we're being attacked, uh, as opposed to suspect or you know being able to infer that we are uh, through some of the conversation, you know, the points that you've raised in an, in our discussion. What kind of uh, is there data? Are there signposts? Are there what should we? How do we know? Well, so we certainly know, for instance, that these are tactics that have been employed elsewhere. So in Australia, uh, there's a couple of very good books about this, uh, about Chinese foreign interference, the Chinese regime's foreign interference. Um, I want to distinguish here between China and the Chinese regime that, of course, distinct entities. Um, and it's quite deliberate efforts to undermine the Australian government and to influence uh, political decision making in, the, in Australia, as a result of which Australia has passed very robust foreign interference legislation that, for instance, if we had this in Canada, would allow us to take uh, much more active measures against uh, flows of money that are coming from outside of the country to support um, uh, the uh, occupation that we're seeing in Ottawa. But of course, what we've seen from the federal government is is um, empty words and denunciations, but no concrete legislative uh, instruments that might actually help us um, uh, contain uh, these sorts of uh, these sorts of financial flows. So uh, there, um, you know, I think there's circumstantial evidence. The reason why I'm not um, uh, by not entirely hopeful is that look, I mean, the our federal criminal and security intelligence agencies, in particular the RCMP and CSIS, should have been able to see coming what's happening. They should have been able, like before you have a protest, there's always a threat assessment, there's a risk assessment that determines your posture, it determines your resourcing, it determines your plan, it determines your response. Um, and so I think they completely missed the fact that these protesters were as determined, as organized, and as well resourced as they are. And of course, that's what we're seeing that poor Peter Slowly is, and as the chief, police chief in Ottawa is now left picking up the pieces. And uh, surprisingly, everybody seems to be criticizing him instead of criticizing the federal institutions uh, that should have kept our country safe and should have seen this uh, and, and, and other institutions that really uh, should have foreseen this. Um, and so this is why I'm saying I'm not entirely, if, if we have intelligence institutions that can't even foresee the intent of a couple thousand truckers that are making their way to Ottawa. Um, I'm not particularly hopeful that we actually have the capability, the capacity and the credibility uh, to ferret out uh, the foreign actors involved here, in part because we have total tunnel vision. The reason why they missed it on the intelligence assessment is because they've been singularly focused on counterterrorism for the past 20 years. And they've had a great difficulty in pivoting to the problem of foreign interference. Uh, and while we see that mentioned in annual reports, we don't actually see concrete action, legislative measures, resourcing by the federal government, or sort of a pivoting in terms of competence. So um, we can hopefully, uh, we'll hopefully see, uh, ironically, the best way we'll probably see some disclosure on this is through the civil action that is being brought to try to sue some of the organizers and get their hands on some of that money. So it is citizens through their court actions that will actually force disclosure perhaps uh, of some of the sources of money rather than the actions of by our own intelligence agencies. Christian, are Canadians too complacent? Have we just had it too good for too long and been too isolated from conflict in other parts of the world to, to wrap our heads around the fact that, that malicious actors are coming for us? We have had our head in the sand for at least 20 years. We still think that this is sort of uh, Senator Dandurand's fireproof house from the 1920s where all the problems of the world are far away, not realizing that we are now, all of us, 
on the front lines of the engagement by uh, outside actors, nefarious actors, bad actors, um, with with our electronic interactions with our machines, for instance, both at home and uh, and at work. And so, you know, Canada has for long, for way too long, had far too homeopathic uh, and national security architecture. And the, I think if there's one silver lining in the protest, it's hopefully that politicians and Canadians realize that our national security posture is no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century, and that we really need to rethink the instruments that we have available and the resourcing that we have available to ensure that on the one hand, people can engage um, in peaceful protest and possibly disruptive peaceful protest, but that we also don't have extremist elements that disavow our values, our institutions, um, their legitimacy, and in the process call into question uh, the security, prosperity, um, and uh, democratic values that we all cherish. Now, final question, Christian, um, because I want to ask you about the politicians, the federal politicians of this. We've seen the People's, uh, uh, People's Party of Canada, uh, led by Maxime Bernier, ally themselves foursquare with the, the protesters. The Conservative Party of Canada uh, did pretty much the same thing, which led to the out, in part to the ouster of, of leader Aaron O'Toole. The federal government, led by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, seems to be taking this seriously, but isn't intervening and is taking a very, seems to me, a legalistic point of view. Uh, and, and I'm wondering if our politicians get it and what role you think they should play uh, in an improved response. I think the political response across the spectrum has been abominable. Um, that when, when the opposition capitalized on the protests, I think for tactical purposes, uh, that the government then doubled down on denouncing the protesters. I think, you know, we, we live in a very divided country. If you look at this country, this should not be a country, given its geographical divide, its religious divides, its linguistic divides. And yet we've managed, with difficulty at times, but we've managed to make this one of the oldest democracies and federations continuously in the world today. And that's because governments, and especially prime ministers, have always had the wherewithal of bringing people together. I remind you of the famous sort of approach to conscription conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription. And that seems to be completely lacking. What we see in Ottawa is tactics in minority governments where everybody's trying to posture uh, for the next election. And I think, you know, we can see this in Joel Lightbound's comments, uh, uh, public remarks, uh, critiquing his own, own uh, prime ministers and government's approach uh, to wedge politics and divisive politics. Um, uh, so uh, I think this is sort of one of my uh, one of my critiques. The other is, of course, the hypocrisy. Right. This is a prime minister who chastised and lectured the Indian prime minister on having to sit down with protesters and negotiate with protesters. And yet, of course, when the protests come to his hometown, he's missing in action. Um, and so I think this is this this to me is uh, is deeply troublesome, as are some of the other comments by some ministers of the crown, for instance, that uh, uh, that 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 that's that uh, that the security and safety of people's lives is much more important than political debate. Um, this suggests to me that there is absolutely no interest in having a political conversation. I think in a democracy, ultimately, um, it, it's about negotiating a common way forward. Democracy is about majority rule, but it is also about minority rights, and it is also about hearing those minorities. Um, of course, it's difficult, uh, admittedly, for a government to engage with um, a minority of protesters that are delegitimizing um, yourself as a person and uh, the institutions, the democratic institutions that you represent. Um, but uh, I'm afraid that I've uh, not been enamored by either the political tactics or the communication strategies employed by any of the political parties um, on the Hill. And I think here's an opportunity at a time of a uh, growing national crisis to actually come together the way we did during other national crises um, across all parties, rather than uh, using this for political uh, to advance uh, partisan political interests. Well, Christian, thank you very much for your insights into an important national issue for, for Canadians. Uh, appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.